The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our readings this morning focus on the theme of coming to God in prayer and even coming to him boldly and persistently. In our first reading today from Genesis chapter 18, Abraham approaches the Lord boldly and persistently about the righteous living in Sodom and Gomorrah. This lesson serves also as the basis for our sermon this morning. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him, what if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. Our second reading today is recorded for us in the first letter that Paul wrote to his understudy pastor named Timothy, the, the second chapter. Here we have the Apostle Paul's inspired instructions about prayer. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. The word of the Lord.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel is the account of the Lord Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. It's recorded for us in the gospel according to St. John, the 11th, of St. Luke, excuse me, the 11th chapter, beginning at the first verse. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we meditate on our first reading today from Genesis chapter 18, let's first ask for God's blessing in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever heard of Richard Dawkins? Does that name ring a bell? If his name doesn't, maybe the book that he wrote will. Richard Dawkins is the now deceased author of a book called The God Delusion. It's kind of become sort of like a a sacred writing, almost like a Bible in a sense, uh, for modern day atheists, as you might expect from the title, The God Delusion. Right? Never read the book myself, not saying you should read it either, um, but I have come across a few um, quotes from this book that I've found to be kind of interesting. One of the most famous ones is actually this one. Dawkins writes, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. That's not even the whole quote. I left out a few adjectives because I was afraid of losing you in the string of them. But you read a quote like that, right? And you can't help but ask yourself, like, is Dawkins right? Is the God of the Old Testament really a petty, unjust person? Is he really vindictive and bloodthirsty? Is he homophobic? Is he a capriciously malevolent bully? Capriciously means that he's carried off on like, emotional whims. 
Malevolent means that he loves doing evil and finds pleasure in it. And bully, you know what that means, right? He, he pushes people around. Can he really be described that way as a capriciously malevolent bully? Well, I don't know for a fact, but I would guess that a guy like Richard Dawkins would probably go to the section of Genesis that we read from this morning, Genesis chapter 18 and 19, to substantiate some of his claims that he makes about the God of the Old Testament, who's also the God of the New Testament. His name is the Lord, right? Because you see, at the end of Genesis 18 and the beginning of Genesis 19, we have the account of how God finally took action against these two infamously wicked cities that were called Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, in these two towns, uh, obvious sin had become so widespread and shameful wickedness so common and natural law so obviously disregarded that the people in that whole area of the world, apparently, were crying out to heaven because of it. And actually, if you'd go home and read the beginning of Genesis 19 this afternoon, you could see why. Because if there were people that were treated the way that the men of Sodom tried to treat the two men who visited Lot's house, you can see why people all over the place, even the heathens, would be crying out to God for justice. And so here's one of the things that actually gets forgotten about in this whole account of Sodom and Gomorrah. What gets forgotten about is that well, people often paint God as, as the bad guy in this story, right? As the guy who comes in and he's bloodthirsty and vindictive and, and petty and unjust. And so what he does isn't really justified. But, but really, in all reality, uh, he's the good guy. He's coming in as the good guy to stop people from continuing to be harmed by these wicked people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Also, did you notice how in this account, at the very beginning, we see how the Lord took great pains, right, to make it clear to us that he never takes the sort of action he took against Sodom and Gomorrah lightly. And that he takes great pains to make sure that that what he's heard in heaven is also true on earth. Um, notice how it says there, uh, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. So God could have just stayed in heaven, right, and sent down fire and brimstone from there and taken care of the problem. But he wanted to make sure first that it was what he was hearing. And so he comes down to earth to actually see and investigate himself so he has all the facts, yeah? So you can see from, from this quote here of the Lord that he doesn't want to destroy anybody. That's not his first instinct. He doesn't want to destroy anybody, but rather he will if he has to. To punish the evildoer, but also to prevent others from being hurt by the evil that the evildoers are doing, and also to warn people against continuing in the ways that the evildoers were practicing. And it just so happens that on the same trip to earth in which the Lord and those two other visitors that came with him, those, those angels in bodily form, came to Abraham and Sarah's house and shared with them that blessed news that they'd finally have the son that they had been waiting for decades for in a year. On that same trip to earth, as God revealed that to Abraham and Sarah, the Lord also revealed to Abraham his plan for Sodom and Gomorrah. And as those two other visitors, the two angels, peeled off and began walking down towards Sodom, Abraham remained and lingered with Abraham. No, I'm sorry, the Lord stayed and lingered with Abraham. And it apparently seems as if Abraham heard about the Lord's plan for Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was thinking about the righteous, the believers who might be living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the thought of them perishing along with the wicked troubled him. And so he approached the Lord. And he essentially said, Lord, 
be true to your name and your nature, what if there's 50 righteous people living in that place, 50 believers in you there? Will you really sweep the whole city away? Won't you save it for the, for the sake of those 50 people? Far be it from you to, to kill the righteous with the wicked and treat the righteous and the wicked alike. That's not who you are. You'll do right, won't you? And how does the Lord respond? He doesn't take Abraham's prayer as an accusation. He doesn't say it's inappropriate. No, he he grants Abraham's request, right? He essentially says, yes, Abraham, I will be true to my name and my nature. If I find 50 righteous people in that place, I will spare the whole place for their sake. When you think about it, that is pretty merciful, isn't it? To save a whole wicked city for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? It's incredibly merciful. And as you heard, Abraham didn't just make this one request. He made, actually, five more requests. Each time coming back to the Lord with a lower and lower number of righteous people for which he would hopefully save the city for. And how did the Lord respond? First, maybe we should ask ourselves, how would we have responded if we were in the Lord's shoes? I don't know, maybe you've sold something on Facebook Marketplace or on Craigslist or at an old-fashioned rummage sale at some point, and you've got a price for that item, right? And what do you think of someone that comes to you and says, well, you want 100 bucks, would you take 90? Well, sure. How about 80? Sure, buddy. Just, what about 75? <laughs> right? After one or two requests, we would probably lose our patience, right? And by the third request, we'd be like, dude, get lost, seriously, right? But not the Lord, right? Six requests asking for a lower and lower and lower number of people. And each time the Lord responds with, yes, for the sake of ten, I will not do it. What a gracious and loving Lord he is, right? That he lowers that number down to ten. And actually one of the coolest parts of this story, actually, I think, is how even before Abraham begins petitioning, on behalf of the righteous who live in Sodom. The Lord's already got a plan in motion to save the righteous who actually live in Sodom. Remember those, uh, those two men that were with the Lord, those two visitors, those two angels in bodily form? They peel off and go down towards Sodom, right? And the Lord stays back with Abraham. Turns out there weren't ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. There were only four. Abraham's nephew, whose name was Lot, Lot's wife, and their two daughters. There's four, right? And if you read the story in Genesis 19, you find out that there came a point in the rescue uh, of these righteous that the angels had to actually grab them by the arm and lead them out of Sodom. Right? How many arms do two angels in bodily form have? Four, right? An arm for Lot, an arm for his wife, an arm for his first daughter, and his second daughter. Sadly, not all were rescued. Uh, Lot's wife, against the angel's orders, turns back and becomes a pillar of salt, right? But that's on her, not on the Lord. The Lord did all he could. Even before Abraham began praying, to make sure the righteous were not swept away with the wicked. So, as you can see from this story, and obviously other ones too, Richard Dawkins has it all wrong. This is not how a capriciously malevolent bully acts. Right? Actually, the God of the Old Testament is what the Old Testament says he is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger 
and abounding in love and faithfulness. And can you believe it? This is the same Lord that you have the privilege of approaching yourself as one of his children in prayer. And your Heavenly Father is not some huge bully like Richard Dawkins makes him out to be. No, he is a gracious and loving Heavenly Father who wants you to come to him in prayer and invites you to. Uh, Even though we don't want to be pestered by people, that really annoys us, the Lord loves to be pestered by your prayers. He loves it when you come to him boldly, persistently, almost pesteringly, in prayer, asking for those things that you need to carry out the different callings that you have in your life. Like being a child of him and of his kingdom. Like being a a husband or a wife or a mother or a father or a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister or a friend or a neighbor or a citizen or a student or an employee, or an employer, or whatever it might be, God loves it when you come to him and you petition him boldly, persistently for the things that you need to carry out these callings that he's given you in his life, or in your life. He wants you to come to him with prayers, petitions, intercessions. That's when you petition God for what others need, like Abraham did in our, in our reading today, and hold their needs before the Lord's throne of grace. He loves to hear words of thanksgiving for blessings already received. He loves to give you every good gift that fits his will for you in Christ Jesus. He delights in it. So what do you need? Do you need faith? By that I mean a stronger faith. Do you need a stronger faith to know and to trust that that your Heavenly Father really is watching out for you and watching over you and that he is by your side each day no matter what you're going through? That he's there with his mercy and grace for you as his son or his daughter? Do you need a a stronger faith to trust that that's actually true? Pray for a stronger faith. Your Heavenly Father delights to give it to you. Do you need godly courage? Godly courage to talk to someone that you know and love because they're lost or or led astray. If you need godly courage, pray to the Lord for godly courage. He would love to give you godly courage. Are you a husband or a wife? Has your marriage grown stale recently? Do you need a greater measure of love and commitment for your spouse? Pray to the Lord for a greater measure of love and commitment to your spouse. He'd love to give that to you because he knows you need it for your marriage. Are you a parent? Is it easy for you to lose your patience with your kids? Or to fly off the handle about something? If that's something you struggle with, pray to the Lord for patience. He would love to give you patience because that would be a blessing to you as you parent your children. Are you a child or a young person? Do you find it hard to be respectful or obedient to a parent or to someone else in authority? Pray to God for a respectful, obedient heart. He would love to give you a respectful, obedient heart. The point is, whatever you need to carry out your callings in life, the Lord wants you to come to him and boldly and persistently ask for it. Because he wants to give it to you anyway. He wants to give you every good gift. Like Jesus says in our gospel, right? Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a, a stone? No one would do that, right? And he says, so if you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more then won't your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit and all of his spiritual gifts to those who ask him? 
Of course he's going to do that, because you're asking for it. And that's why Jesus says, right, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For whoever asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Right? These are things that you need for your callings. He wants to give them to you. So ask him. But there's one other thing yet we should always make sure we ask for and pray for, right? And Jesus teaches us to ask for this too. We ought to always ask for the forgiveness of our sins, right? I don't know, maybe just talking about prayer today has made you feel guilty because you've been lax in prayer lately. Maybe talking about bold and persistent prayer has made you feel guilty just because maybe you think you can't describe your prayer life as bold or persistent. It's, it's often timid or intermittent, right? Or maybe something else is troubling you, some other sin, and in the back of your mind, in the back of your soul, you're, you're honestly wondering, well, maybe God's going to eventually deal with me like he dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and 19. Or maybe you've been struggling with sin so much that, that you almost feel guilty even asking for forgiveness because at this point you just feel like you've fallen so much that you don't deserve it, right? Well, if you feel guilty about having a lacking prayer life, you should. Um, if you feel like you deserve God's wrath, for sin, you do. If you have a healthy fear of God's judgment, that's a good, healthy fear to have. Right? And also, if you, if you think that you don't deserve forgiveness, you are exactly correct. Neither do I. But here's the cool part. What did Jesus teach us to pray? He said, when you pray, say, among other things, Father, forgive us our sins. He teaches us to pray that. Why? Because the Heavenly Father not only loves to be pestered by our prayers, but he also delights in forgiving us our sins. He delights in showing mercy and grace. In fact, he tells us in his word that that he has forgiven all of our sins, that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's why Jesus came and lived and died and rose again. He came to, to wipe away all of our sins in his blood and to blot them out of God's record and to assure us that by his life and his death and his resurrection, we are right with God and have peace with him. God loves to answer that prayer, forgive us our sins. He's answered it in Christ. One more proof, right, that a guy like Richard Dawkins has it all wrong. This is not how a capriciously malevolent bully acts. No. The God of the Old and the New Testament, the Lord, he is what the Bible says he is. He is a gracious and compassionate God who's slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness to us too. So let us go to him in prayer. Let us lay before him all our requests for the things that we need for our life on this earth in body and soul. Let's go to him boldly and persistently and even with shameless audacity and lay our requests before the Lord and know that he hears us and he answers us according to his gracious will.
Please stand as we join in the responsive prayer of the church. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the holy church of God throughout the world, that God the Almighty Father gather and guide it so that we may worship him in peace and tranquility. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. Guide the work of the church, help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your word, and bring salvation to people everywhere. Let us pray for our pastors and teachers and all leaders in the church and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold all who serve you and your people. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church. Help each of us to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that the light of the Holy Spirit may show them the way to salvation. Almighty and eternal God, enable those who do not acknowledge Christ to receive the truth of the gospel. Help us, your church, to grow in love for you and one another so that we become more perfect witnesses of your love for all people. Let us pray for those who serve in public office, that God may guide their minds and hearts so that all of us may live in true peace and freedom. Almighty and eternal God, graciously direct those who have been set in positions of authority among us so that people everywhere may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. Let us pray that God, the almighty and merciful Father, may heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, and free those unjustly deprived of liberty. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. In your mercy, hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. Lord God, we praise you for bringing Luann Rakoff safely through eye surgery this past Thursday. We give thanks that you have provided her with both physical and spiritual strength during this trial, and we trust that you'll continue to watch over Luann in all things and empower her to glorify your name each day. Gracious Lord, in your goodness, you bring people together into families and enrich their lives with abundant blessings. We thank you for uniting Sam Goodman and Alyssa Matheny together in marriage yesterday. We ask that you would bless their marriage, that you'd bless them with contentment, companionship, and according to your will, children. Grant that they love each other in the way that you have loved us, and be with them in good times as well as difficult times, and be their shield and strength throughout their days as husband and wife. And now hear us, Lord God, as we bring you our private petitions. We humbly ask all these things through Christ our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory.